Hi, welcome to the ADK Rock and Metal channel. I am delighted that we've got Andy with us and we're interviewing one of our favorite black and death metal bands. Uh, certainly one of the best bands in London, and that is Forbiter. Hello, Forbiter. Mark Dios and Deborah Conservo. Can you give us a wave? Hi. Hi. <laughs> death metal wave, Molly joking. Uh, <laughs> we always start these interviews. Sometimes the question can be very generic about the meaning of the band name. We're not going to start with that. How do we pronounce the band name? <laughs> well, none of us are Greek, so we're, we're probably not the best place to answer it. But um, for, be for Beta? Oh, uh, I'm not actually really sure. I think it's something like for Betor or something like this, but I'm not really 100% sure. I generally just pronounce it for Beter. Because we asked Alec so, before, didn't we? Yeah, we did ask someone like, yeah, we did ask like the singer from Eight Leaves Down um, to to tell us uh, how to pronounce for Beter or for Better or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure because she's Greek. So, just, yeah. just give us an idea. This is a Greek god, isn't it? Like a malevolent presence in dreams. Have I misinterpreted that? Yes, it's like uh, it's the Greek god of nightmares, right? Um, and generally, like he can basically uh, show himself into your dreams in the forms of rats or spiders, etc., things like this. So, Andy, have we agreed on the pronunciation from this a bit for beta going forward? Is that what we're going to do? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, That's I mean, agreed on. <laughs> there's probably two or three that I I sort of think and, and say, but just just one more time, was it? For Beetle. For Beetle, yeah. yeah. For Beetle. That's how, that's how we right. say it. Anyway. We're not precious, it's all right. Remember, yeah. the, remember <laughs> the B syllable in the middle, I think you'll, you'll, you'll catch it from that. If you remember the okay. B syllable, the rest kind of just, just fits, okay. We're pronouncing it in Greek. So, let's start with the origins of the band. I'll just give an introduction and I first discovered you guys watching YouTube during the lockdown and you must have had a paid ad in between, I don't know what video it was, maybe a nuclear blast artist, and the song, A Toxic Lie, came on. And I was working at the time when I paused it, it's like, what the hell is this? Because of the vocals from you, Deborah. But there's, there's, it's quite technical as well. So mm. what were the origins of this band? Because Mark, people know you as the drummer from the symphonic power metal band, Pythia. Deborah, you were in a band called, is it Eater of Man in the past? Yeah, I used to, I used to play with them, yeah, before, yeah. What are the, how, how did Fabita come about then? Um, it was mostly, I uh, met up in um, in London with Mitch uh, and we, you know, we got chatting and we were both interested in music. Uh, so we became friends and things like this. And, and from there, we d decided that we wanted to start writing some music. Um, we started with just like um, playing some cover songs here and there of like bands that we generally liked. And then we decided, like, let's start writing our own stuff. Um, so Mitch started, like, uh, writing down, like, a few riffs and things like this, showing to me as well, <laughs> because Jasper. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I started putting vocals onto there. We started to do things like this, and slowly we built um, our first album from there. What year did you, did you start writing songs with uh, Mitch Revy then? Uh, Christ. Yeah, what was that? Uh, <laughs> Just before, well, before lockdown. And yeah, stuff. it so was 20, it 2019, was 2018, something like that. 2018, yeah, actually it was 2018. Yes, yeah. it is 2018. Yeah, definitely that. Mm -mm. So, so I sort of came into play in terms of, um, they've been through a few different drummers and a few different musicians and the lineup wasn't particularly stable. Um, and obviously, be married to Deborah. It was sort of well, I'll step in and I'll, I'll play a few gigs. And I did the odd show here or there. I think I actually did the first gig that they actually ever played with them, but it wasn't a permanent thing. Mm. And then um, I wouldn't say it started falling apart, but it just got a little bit rocky. Um, and I was like, well, I'll, I'll step in and I'll I'll join full time. You know, mm. I, I really like the stuff that's been written. Um, <laughs> For the for the first album so i learned the songs i went in the studio and recorded those <laughs> and um we obviously played played the underworld show together yeah. um and that was sort of the end of that lineup because then obviously lockdown 
um, then happened like weeks after we did the, sh the mm. show at the yeah, Underworld with right. Memoriam. Yeah. Um, but the album was written and pretty much recorded. Um, but we needed to obviously release it, which meant doing videos and things. Mm. And it was, it was difficult. awkward yeah. trying to do that with all the social distancing and regulations in mm. place. Mm -hmm. But finally, I think it was sort of um, <laughs> death metal screams there in the background. Um, it was finally in early summertime we were able to film the video for a toxic lie. Yeah. Um, so um, from that point, um, we, we obviously released the first album, and then Mitch then sort of left the band. He didn't really want to pursue. I don't know if it was music generally or metal music mm. um and he's since moved to the other side of the world as well yeah moved to south korea <laughs> <laughs> um so that's kind of the origins of it i mean my origins yeah. as you say are pythia since 2007 when i started that but before that um i was in a thrash death metal band called descent and that was with ross white on guitar mm. that's where ross is from right exactly, yeah so it was like Right, okay, we're looking for another guitarist. The first phone call's always to Ross. <laughs> Are you up for it? You know, we've got the first album just out, but we want to write straight away to crack on with the second album. Um, and that's sort of where it, where it sort of led to, really. That's the origins of the band, I guess, in a sort of nutshell. Yeah, just, just for the benefit of our viewers. So in 2020, you released your debut album, When Life Falls Silent. Yeah. I reviewed that for Screen Blast Repeat, and I, I, I ended up nominating it. I think it was the second best debut album of the year. And then the one that blew me away, the one that you're still touring at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, 2021, wasn't it? Through Deepest yeah. Fears and Darkest Minds. Yeah. That yeah. is a masterpiece. But Andy, you want to ask about the songwriting for that album, don't you, given the the, the, the changes in lineup? Yeah. Mm. Um, Deborah, you explained the uh, writing for the original songs in the first album as yourself and, and Mitch. Um, yeah. Kirk reliably informs me that it was yourself and, and Mark that come up with the, um, the the bulk of the material for the second album. Is um, you know, for everybody sort of watching, they think, well, that's you've got a vocalist as a drummer there. How, how did that how did that came come to be? If if what I've said is correct, and, and you know, have you got sort of uh, guitar links, you know, guitar skills being in yourselves? Yeah, I don't think we can claim that. I think like no. Ross was really yes. the man behind it. Yes, the, the I riffs. I don't play any any guitar or anything like that. So I just do vocals really. Um, I used to try to do a few bits with the drums, but you know a few years ago, but I never really developed into anything. So it was it's always been mostly vocals for me. Um, but yeah, it's it's Ross most of the time. He you start writing, it come with some ideas, writing some riffs, and then. He would send them to Mark. Mark would write some drums onto it. And then once the drums and the guitars are in place, uh, I will start writing vocals for that. We record the demo and we go from there, basically. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a, both albums are colossal when it comes to the guitar work. And it's mm -hmm. like when you listen to the early Carcass stuff and you find out that the drummer was writing it. It's like, why is the drummer presenting guitar riffs to arguably the finest guitar player of that generation? Oh. Bill Steer and uh, writing songs. So I thought that's what was happening here. So you must have been confident then. So I remember speaking to you and you said, we've got the second album underway. We're going to announce a guitar player soon. I just thought you hadn't found one yet and you'd written all the songs and you're just going to bring it. Uh, yeah, bring I'll, it I'll get away with claiming that one. <laughs> we won't have a guitarist for much longer if I say that. So Yeah, because I, I, I just, I, the, the thing is, with that, I remember that when I was listening to a lot of death metal in 2021. Honestly, a lot of it, I was just bored halfway through. It's either the reactionary stuff, which is good when it goes back to the old school, the jazz fusion type stuff, the prog stuff, and then your album comes out, the set, the sophomore album, and it's like, you've got the precision of Bolt Thrower, you've got the, the great riffs of Carcass, and you've got mm -hmm. these really esoteric lyrics as well, and, and obviously, Mark, your drum work is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Deborah. I know we can read into the title of the second album. Is it a concept album? And what, what is the album about, the, late, the latest release? Yeah, actually, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider the second album a concept album. I would say that a concept album was more appropriate for the first album because there was very much around the idea of mental illness. Uh, but uh, 
for the second album, it, it is a bit of a mixture. In the sense, it's like some of those songs are, you know, personal to me. But there are also like certain songs, for example, I saw in Nihility. Um, I wrote that, uh, those lyrics, based on my feelings and and generally how I, I used to see the world when we were in, in lockdown. Um, the idea of like uh, time that seems like to be fro to uh, tend to be to be frozen and like like never never ending is like in a constant perpetual time you know kind of things like this this is like um, the kind of idea that I wanted to portray in the lyrics there um, I do tend to like to write lyrics in a more esoteric way because um, I want it to appeal to everyone, like everyone can find their own meaning in what they're reading instead of actually telling you what to, uh, what this is about. So it's like, you know, kind of more open, open lyrics in a kind of sense like that. Uh, so some of these are, are on, on this side, other ones were more like based on the sufferings of war and how uh, war can impact the life of innocent people and things like this so it's it's kind of a mixture of those things but i think even when you go into those subjects like war which obviously can be a cliche yeah. subject in especially metal music it's focusing always on the individual and yeah. the and the uh, the effect of situations um uh rather than just war is war, war is bad or blood and guts war those sort of things it was yeah always about the individual and I think even that's carried through from the first album so yeah. the first album was very much about as you said mental issues and, and different um, different things on that side of things mm. and it's still that and I think if you if your lyrics are personal or from a personal perspective that sort of target mm. I think it's um, appeals to a wider audience I suppose it's a bit mm. more universal rather than just blood and guts metal or yeah. war metal or this nothing wrong with any of those and we're all into bands like that mm. but I, I don't know for us it just felt r right to be I suppose a little bit more about the, the individual and personal stuff so. I mean to a certain extent I think we did a bit of that when on the first album I'm thinking about the the song psychopathy um, which, which was, you know, as the name says, based on the on psychopathy, basically, as a mental illness. Um, and yeah, that, that whole kind of uh, song was um, revolved around um, the idea of the psychopathic serial killer. And that was kind of very gruesome, in a kind of sense, it was very literal, the lyrics of the of that kind of song. But yeah, I think that's the only song I've ever wrote like that because every everything else has always been very much like esoteric kind are, of weird. Are your lyrics, lyrics, you know, because um, academically um, you you've studied um, you did, what did you do a master's in recently? Was that um, was, oh yes, I did a master in film studies. That's it. So are, are some of your lyrics then almost voyeuristic? You know, you're assuming characters and protagonists in in these songs. Yeah, I, I will say I will say so because, um, uh, for example, one way that I tend to tend to write, for example, is sometimes I I'm watching something and I focus on a particular image, and from that image is like something uh, like arising some feelings within me, and from there I start to like picture this whole story in my mind about how that character is feeling that person is feeling and from there I kind of like start to write write down everything like the way I, I, I think that that person is feeling in that situation and in this case it would be in the case of war for example. Yeah I think on a, on a personal um, level for both of us individually in everyday life I think we're quite empathetic people we always yeah. sort of think oh my oh my god that must be terrible and mm -hmm. how you know how bad is that and things so mm -hmm. probably is a an element of that yeah yeah definitely there's no there cynicism is. though is there there's no cynicism in those lyrics because sometimes you'll get a go metal band and it's almost like yeah let's just celebrate the how nasty and mean and misanthropic people are yeah. and we're just gonna laugh and we're not gonna do anything to change but it. again nothing wrong with that because sometimes you're in that mood whereas hmm. the thing though do you remember the, your debut album it was described wasn't it um 
as nihilistic extreme metal. I certainly wouldn't use that term for your sophomore effort. I mean, I'm just going to read a quote. When I reviewed When Life Falls Silent, I said, it surges through the speakers like an iron flail in search of a human head. You know, it's so heavy and aggressive. <laughs> But there were a lot of progressive elements in that debut album. And on the sophomore, how would you describe the evolution from When Life Falls Silent to Through Deeper Spheres and Darkest Minds on a musical level? How would you yeah, describe think, that evolution? Yeah, well, I think Ross steered that ship because mm. obviously having that first album already out, it would have been odd to do something completely different mm. because it was like, well, in a way, what's the point of keeping the band name if it's going to sound completely different to the first album. So he wanted to keep elements of, of progressive um, progressive elements into the stuff without going too over the top. Um, but just taking those, you know, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of death metal and black metal and, and what have you, the little ingredients that are in the first album, um, <clears throat> make it, take it somewhere that we wanted the band to go. Mm. So we, we really wanted to go more in that black and death metal direction, mm. which the first album is to a certain extent. But I think the, um, you know, uh, Through Deeper Spheres just takes it right in that direction yeah. in terms of imagery, um, probably lyric, lyrically more and certainly music more. Obviously, um, the mix of not just blast beats and things, but also some slow doom sections as well. Just, mm. it's difficult to try and describe how it sounds. I know we struggle with that when, mm -hmm. when the album was written. It's sort of a little bit of everything. Um, it's got some doom aspects. It's got some prog aspects. Yeah. But the, predominantly, you would describe it as black and death metal. Yeah. Um, mm. That's probably the direction that we will stay in, but we may well veer off in slight slight directions you know more sort of doom more blast beats we'll have to see what happens really mm. on the next album but yeah so is uh so for those who don't know so the lineup expands on the latest album so you bring in ross who was in the band descent with you and then the bass player dredgewood and then at the moment you've also got on live guitar ben ash formerly of carcass and satiricon who is in strigoi at the moment yeah. Mm -hmm. Is he a permanent live member? Or is he going to be writing on the next album? Have you not even looked at it beyond just this this touring cycle? Yeah, we've not really looked at it too long term. Um, it was just the fact that we know Ben. Um, he, he was around and he was up for doing it. And um, yeah. so far, he's been able to do all the live shows with us since the release of the second album. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, he's having to juggle other aspects. Strigo have got quite a lot going on on the festival front this year and some other shows. So um, we have to obviously respect that. That's obviously um, his, his first job, if you will. Mm. Um, but yes, as long as he can sort of join us on, on stage, then it's it's great. It works really well. Yeah. So do you know the bass player Dredgewood? What, what's her background? I think when I met you at the last gig, was she in a grindcore band? Yeah, mm. she was in a band called Meat Train. Have you heard of that, Andy? Um, no, meat, meat train, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, they're not really um, doing much these days, but um, they were around for a, a few years and, and went out and played in China and places like that. <laughs> so, like, yes. Cultural uh, export from Britain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um But yeah, no, we've known her a long time. Um, yeah. And it was just, again, it was just another easy phone call right we need a bassist hmm. Are you, do you fancy it sort of thing and yeah she was she was up for writing and uh, recording bass parts and things so again it's worked out and the lineup's been pretty stable really since um yeah. since those two joined so so do you know when when did descent split up oh god <laughs> it's just, <No. laughs> uh, 2009 i think it was 2009 so what has ross white been doing since um descent came to an end Obviously, you've got Pythia. What has he been doing from 2009 up until the present day? He's also in Pythia. Yeah. Oh, is he? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, no one um, said it's like yeah. the first phone call. <laughs> it was exactly that. It was exactly that when I started Pythia. <laughs> Cross pollination. I was, um, the, the, vo the vocalist at the time, Emily, was up for, for 
um, doing a band sort of thing. So as you said, the first phone call was like, oh, Ross, looking for a guitarist, are you up for it? So that, that was it. But, you know, we've worked together for almost 20 odd years, well, nearly 25 years probably. So we know how we work. Um, yeah. There's no egos. There's no aggro. Um, yeah. we're, we're more chilled than we were yeah. 20 years ago, you know, with things. And it's just it's just easy when you when you're working in a band where everyone's nice and friendly gets the job done yeah that's all you can ask for really absolutely yeah yeah i mean just before i hand you over to andy then how quickly did that second album come together you know because you said you've been working with ross for 25 years he says yeah. yes <laughs> start sending you riffs how quickly yeah, we've not been working on it for 25 years <laughs> not 25 years what did you say sorry you no, we have, we've years. been working together, but yeah, obviously not this album. <laughs> not the way. Five years. <laughs> Good one, said 25. Okay, apologies for that. Just for the record, Mark is not in his 50s. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. Um, no, how how quickly did it come together, that that album though? The second album, as soon as he was on board? But very quickly. Actually, yeah, that was quite quickly. It was probably one year. Was it one year ago? No, probably Just, less. Yeah, probably from from the start of writing to the album release was probably about the recording year. and everything else. Yeah, yeah. If you consider everything together, the recording and the which, and the writing, which can sound a long time, but in the music world, actually, it's like it's quite quick. Yeah, and sometimes it can take a good yeah. couple of years or so yeah, to yeah. get something from fruition to mm. completion, especially something as good as that. Because I keep saying it, the riffs on that album. They're almost like once in a career standard. And you're saying you invited him in and within a year, you know, you've produced this this album, which I said really was the most interesting death metal album of 2021 for me. Um, and and Dred one, one thing I will ask as well, Dredgewood, what, what does she bring to the band? Um, it's always difficult with bassists because you try not to offend them, but you know, it's right. <laughs> Oh yeah, but when I, when I say the question, I'm not saying she's superfluous. <laughs> so I just clarify, she's excellent live on stage. But what dynamic? If you notice an extra dynamic that she's brought to the band? Yeah, I mean, I think bass-wise, um, in terms of recording material, the first album, uh, Richard, who was um, session player on that album, he's um, he's quite a fancy player, and. I th as great as his playing is, I think it, sometimes it lacks that just low end punchiness and chug that you need with this sort of music. So, sometimes mm. with bass, it's you don't necessarily notice it's there, but you mm. notice if it's not there. Mm. It's one That's of those true. things, you know, it's about covering that low frequency, a lot of, lot of power and a lot of drive. And she's done that in the recording and also, as you say, on stage, um, a great, great sound on that. Um, and again, it's just on a personal level, very sort of easy to deal with, um, very sort of efficient and professional with stuff. Mm. So it's yeah, it's, it's a big part of it, you know. Mm. Definitely, Andy. Hi, yeah. Um, not really a question; it's more more an observation and, and some feedback for you, Deborah. When I when I saw you guys last year, what I took away from the show, obviously apart from your amazing vocals, was your your sort of uh, your delivery and your your style on stage. You. You're, you're quite diminutive. You're, you're not the, the, you know, you're quite quite small. You're sitting there, you're standing there, centre stage. You pick a focal point, and you you lock onto that. You deliver your line. There's a couple of head bangs, and you're back onto the next line, and back into the head bang. And I mean, it's, it's something I've not seen before. Is that sort of a, was that a conscious decision from you, or just how you develop your sort of stage performance? Actually, um, I, I wouldn't say it was a necessary conscious decision. It was more like what felt natural for me to do at the time, but um, something I would say is more conscious instead is the fact of um, having the kind of, um, kind of, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say monstrous, but I don't know how else to, to describe it, but like this kind of like horror type of appeal where you like, you know, having this kind of like possessed look where you like looking into the audience and it's like you look like a very evil possessed person or something like this. That's what I'm trying to achieve. So I want to give like kind of the horror type of feel to that. Um, 
And also, as I mentioned before, coming from film studies, I'm a big fan of horror movies, so it's all connected there in a kind of sense. So uh, it, it all comes from this, uh, this. This is the conscious decision I would say I would make on that. Everything else about the headbagging and all the other things that I have developed, I think that's more like a natural kind of feel there. I, I had um, when I was on stage. And you know? I think that's also part of the overall um, sort of see, what can you say, image rather of the band as that yeah. progressed as well. Musically, it progressed into the second album. I think when it came to doing the photos and getting the artwork and the live um, imagery and, and performance side of things, mm. I think that's a lot more cohesive and, and uniform now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as you said, really picks up on the darker, um, as well, the black and death metal yeah. side of things without being too much, you know, too much sort of makeup and no, of course, either, uh, so. yeah. But also, if you think about Forbitter in itself, like the god of nightmares, it's also like very connected with horror and things like this, so it kind of everything kind of merges together there as well. So, yeah. Um, as we discussed, you've got your two great albums already released and, and you know, I'm sure you're, you're writing new material. So out, out of that sort of bank of 15, 16 songs, is there one that's always going to be on the set? Is there like a, a band or a fan favourite that you're always going to be playing, you know, in the foreseeable future anyway, or, or, or you know, oh. on this recent tour? I would say probably Solace and Darkness, the first single mm, we, we released. That's what, yeah. Good energy on, on that one, I really love that's playing true. that live. I was thinking about Screaming Silence as well, to be honest, as well. Yeah, yeah I've got probably, as I said, the singles, I mean, yeah. that obviously that, um, we did the lyric video for Screaming Silence and we had the music mm. videos for um, Solace and Darkness and Silent Nihility. Mm. Those are probably the three that's even then into the, the next album and beyond, I'd imagine, would still be hovering around the set. Mm. Yeah. And leads me nicely on to my final sort of question. What are the plans for the band, you know, for the rest of 2023? Um, you know, more shows, recording and, and a future release, maybe? Yeah, I mean, um, mm. we've got the, the next show up is um, at the uh, the Dome in London, um, mm. supporting Warbringer, which we're really looking forward to. That's the 29th yes. of this month. Mm. Um, beyond that, obviously, we're looking to see what other shows we can, we can line up. Mm. Um, but yeah, other than that, we are looking to hopefully start getting some initial riffs and ideas together for the next album. There's no real timeline on that at this stage, but um, I would have thought within the next six months, something like that, that we would start to sit down and, and get some, some ideas together. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to wrap things up? That's, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to know, whether there's going to be an album number three or maybe it might be an EP that's coming out in the future. Um, is it definitely going to be an album, do you think, the next release? Um, hopefully. Yeah, ideally, I, yeah. We, we love albums. Yeah. You know, it's, it's never quite the same with an EP. Um, mm. I'm just from that, as you said, I'm old, Kirk, so. <laughs> the same um, age, Mark, I will clarify. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I grew up on like, you know, Number of the Beast and Master of Puppets and those albums. And it, it's such a big thing for me, and I, I don't know, just tracks being released individually and, you know, a few few songs here. I know it is the thing to do these days, and I quite understand mm. that it's the direction the music industry is going. Mm. Um, but yeah, my personal preference is always albums. Yeah, same for me. Can. I'm the same as well. And just for the benefit of our viewers, Mark, your favourite band is Paradise Lost, isn't it? And I don't think they've ever released an EP, have they? Maybe a single that's extended with B-sides, but they are the ultimate albums band, aren't they? Paradise Lost. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and one of those bands that's exactly that. You put on an album from start to finish. I can't imagine that you would skip tracks, maybe rarely if there's an album of theirs which you're not particularly keen on, but you know, generally mm. they're classic albums and things. Um, Plague Within, Draconian Times, mm. Host, anything like that, really, you can't go wrong, mm. start to finish. And that's the whole journey yeah. of, of an album. So that's that's what we love. And, it, you know, there's loads of bands. I mean, Deborah's favourite band is Behemoth and the same sort of thing. Yeah. Start to finish, listen to an album. So, <laughs> Yeah, definitely understand. Well, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to come on the ADK Rock and Metal channel. So 
everybody go and check out the two albums that Fabita have released um and you will be able to catch them certainly um it's easy to easier to watch you guys if you're based in the southeast isn't it but you're a london band so uh mm. you know that that makes it relatively easy for people all over certainly england never mind the rest of the uk to come to come down for a show so yeah thanks very much really appreciate your time and we absolutely want another record as soon as possible <laughs> cheers, cheers. Thank cheers you. guys